Thank you very much, Aradna, and thank you very much for having me here. Um, to start with, I would like to ask you a question, actually, to the ones here in the room and the ones joining us remotely. And this question is, what do you think icebergs and emotions have in common? And I don't want you to answer this question, just answer it in your head, maybe. Think about it. And I'm not going to give you an answer right away. Maybe some of what I will talk about today give you hints to what an answer to this could be. Maybe not, but let me tell you so much, they have quite a lot in common. And for the next 18 minutes, I would like to invite you on an expedition through icy waters. And we may be sailing in a boat, we may be diving in ice water wetsuits, or we may be aboard a submarine. But before we get into any of these icy waters, they're a bit uncomfortable, even though I'm quite comfortable in cold weather, as you can see here on the picture behind me, I would like to start at land. And actually, I would like to take you this works. Yeah. To northern Germany, to Bremen, where I'm from, and actually to the cozy living room of my parents' house. A living room looking out into a very green garden with wooden floors, an entire wall shelf filled with books, cozy armchairs and a couch. And a lot of our family life took place in this living room, and as you can imagine, a lot of the fighting and arguing also took place in that living room. Well, Fighting and arguing with my dad looked like this. As you can imagine, fighting with my dad was um, a little bit complicated or virtually impossible. My dad worked as a dentist and in his free time and in his breaks he was reading the newspaper or books, magazines, sitting in one of the cozy armchairs. And actually he's, he's not a very conflict friendly person in the sense that he doesn't like conflicts very much. So fighting with him or annoying him for me as a kid was only possible by punching against this newspaper or pushing down his book. Fighting with my mom on the other hand worked really well, especially in puberty, let me tell you so much. But uh, when it came to resolving our conflicts or resolving an argument we had, there is one image that comes to my mind and that's the following. Resolving an argument was almost always stopped by her at some point. When I was little, uh, she just asked me to go away. When my arguments got better, she just said, I don't want to talk about this now anymore. <laughs> <laughs> what I want to say with this, I come from a beautiful and caring family, yet a conflict-averse family. And probably my parents themselves come from conflict-averse families where managing a conflict meant ignoring it, ignoring it and just hoping that if enough time passes the conflict would magically disappear. Well, without this conflict culture or maybe the lack of it, I would probably not be where I am today, very interested in my own conflicts, my own conflict behavior and getting into conflicts of other people and helping to resolve them. So, another stop at land before we dive into the icy waters actually goes to Colombia. Uh, before joining Hervitas, I worked with the Geneva International Center for Humanitarian Demining, an NGO supporting the reduction of risks from explosive ordnance and so that communities can live without danger of landmines, anti-vehicle mines, cluster munitions, explosive remnants of war. And Colombia is one of the most heavily contaminated countries when it comes to anti-personnel mines, especially improvised anti-personnel mines. And by improvised, I mean a PET bottle turned into something that would go bang. So in 2016, we went to Santa Elena in the department of Meta, and we visited a very unique pilot project, a demining pilot project that was part of the peace negotiations that took place between the government of Colombia and the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, People's Army, the FARC, in Havana. And in this pilot project, they defined two zones, one in Santa Elena and one a bit further in the north, where government officials, the Colombian army, Colombian soldiers, and FARC members would jointly work together to find and to remove mines. This is a picture that I took of a FARC lady, a member of the FARC at the left, and a Colombian soldier in Santa Elena. This was after work of the day was done. And seeing these two enemies, or old enemies, working together, playing soccer in the camp uh, after work, and actually casually talking about, I don't know what they talked about afterwards, 
to me was a very, very strong testament to the power of dialogue. And in 2017, we went to another area. This was actually very close to the second pilot zone in Briseño, in the Department of Antioquia, a bit further in the north. And in 2017, the pilot project had been completed. And then FARC members were actually, that had left the FARC and had demobilized, they joined a Norwegian NGO. And on the one hand, they brought their experience in knowing where they located the mines, how they built them. And on the other hand, they were trained in humanitarian and demining themselves. And the three guys that you can see here at the left were former FARC members, and there we were discussing the details of just how fine explosive material can be, whether it's like sand or whether it's like icing sugar. And uh, for me, these trips to Colombia were very special. I already mentioned the testament um, of the power of dialogue. I set foot into the first, probably the only minefield in my life. This is me in body armor. And uh, to me, minefields are very exemplary of how I like to approach conflicts. Because in order to remove mines, you need to know where they are. Sometimes you need to dig a little deeper, sometimes not so deeply. You need to look at them closely in order to know how you want to dispose of them. And if you've removed them, you can walk safely again. And I knew I didn't want to stay in mine action forever. And uh, conflict management and mediation had interested me for a very, very long time. So in 2017, I decided to start training as a conflict manager and mediator in Berlin. And uh, one, of the, one of the first things I want to share with you is that conflicts are natural. They occur all the time and they will continue to do so. So the goal should not be to get rid of conflicts because that's impossible. The question is just how we deal with them, because how you carry out a conflict can be destructive or can be really productive as well. And there are three main ways in which you can deal with a conflict. It can be a power decision, it can be rules that you have to abide by, or you mediate between different needs, interests, and positions. Just to give you a quick glimpse at what, how mediation is defined, we will dig deeper into these afterwards. Christopher Moore, a mediation trainer and published author from the US, defines mediation as the intervention of an acceptable, impartial and neutral third party who has limited and no authoritative decision-making power, and this is really important. They don't decide about the process, it's the parties deciding. They assist the involved parties in voluntarily reaching a mutually acceptable agreement or settlement <coughs> to the issues in dispute. A lot here, but we will dig deeper into some of these now as we go on. One of the first images that uh, I remember from my mediation training was the one of an iceberg, and now the icy part starts. And what's interesting here is not only the part above the water that you can see, but the big chunk that's underneath. That actually is where most of what mediation is takes place, because the iceberg underneath the water holds a lot of emotions, fears, wishes, and interests that are very crucial to be looked at. Even though there is no standard process for mediation, there are several phases that a mediative process tends to follow. And at the beginning is the introduction to the process. There we're still at the very visible part at the beginning. For example, I highlighted in the definition, it's a voluntary process, both parties need to be there voluntarily. Sometimes that's a bit trickier if the employer says, the two of you go see a mediator, but ultimately it's the two of them wanting to reach an agreement. The things that are discussed are confidential and whatever is shared there need to be agreed upon by the involved parties, could be two, could be more. And the role of the mediator as this neutral, facilitating person, but not deciding person is also defined in that process. In a second step, the topics are collected. So both parties will have the chance, both parties or several, whenever there are several, have the, the, the opportunity to tell what the conflict is about, what their issue is. And here it's really important to not judge and to write this down in a neutral way. So for example, if we have two conflict parties and one topic is party A says, party B accused me. And if you then write down accusation of party B, 
well, party B will be rather offended. So if you say sentence set at bar on day X, you're in safe waters. And the third phase is the one where it's, where it's getting really interesting. And that's the deepening phase where you elucidate the conflict, where you shed light on the conflict. And uh, I did it on purpose to put the three phases like this because with the third phase we're going underneath water. As I said, we may be sailing in a boat as we did at the beginning where you could still see the, what is above the water or the shallow waters underneath the surface. And for the deepening phase, it's very important to look behind the, inter behind the positions, to look for the interests. And what I mean with a position is reoccurring very firm statements by the parties. Let's take a conflict between two colleagues who want to go on leave at the same time, but they can't because they're substituting each other. And one says, I asked for leave first, and the other one says, I have a kid, I need to go then. If you focus on these positions, the positions will become harder but not softer. But if you look at what's behind these statements, then you can find a reconciliation between these. And here it's really important to dive as deeply as needed, but not as deeply as possible. You don't have to go to the bottom of the soul of your conflict parties and find out about their traumas of their childhood. That's not necessary, only if it's helpful for the conflict. So you may be in an ice water wetsuit, and diving by yourself in the underneath the surface and to a certain depth. Or sometimes you need to spend more time looking at the iceberg in closer detail and there it may be very useful to be aboard a submarine and have that support to be able to go deeper. In a fourth phase, usually this already starts during the deepening phase because during the deepening phase a magic thing usually takes place and that's the change of perspective. Party A understands what party B means and vice versa. And all of a sudden they're like, oh my God, we've known each other for so long. I never knew you thought like this, you felt like this. And from there, options appear. They make suggestions, they offer things, and you collect these. Again, in a neutral way. And what you do with that at the end is a little, a little treasure box of an agreement of solutions, packages of solutions where you collect win-win options for both parties, so mutually agreeable and mutually beneficial solutions. And at Helvetas, most of you know, I work in project monitoring where indicators and objectives have to be smart, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound, and also these solutions should hold these criteria in order to be um, implemented afterwards. Uh, in one of the practice projects we did during my training, we mediated a team conflict in a uh, medium-sized company in Berlin, and we made a summary of what we did there in terms of this installation. With a lot of creativity, you can definitely see that this is an iceberg. <laughs> Anything above the table were the positions and the statements we knew of before we actually met the people. So things that they accused the others of, problems that were there, but we didn't really know what was underneath. Even though anything above the table is, it's a bit, it's organized, but already a bit messy, but definitely underneath the table, you can see it's really messy. So this, these were the interests and fears and feelings of the people in the team that we uncovered during this mediation process. And how do you, how do, you do this really? I wanted to share this with you. And actually a lot of that can be done with a mediative attitude. What do I mean by that? This mediative attitude is composed of several characteristics. First of all, you need to have a relationship of trust and understanding. And that holds for the mediator with the conflict parties. Again, how do you achieve this? As human beings, we're not that complicated, actually. One very effective way is by paraphrasing what the parties are saying. So you briefly summarize what they say, and you regularly do that throughout the dialogue. And that helps for you to understand what the conflict party is talking about, and the conflict party feels really understood by you and trusts you. It can be very simple. Then, as I said before, you have to focus on the interests and rather than the positions. So you need to look at what's behind it, what emotions are behind certain statements. And their active listening plays a very important role, and mirroring. I actually don't know if that word exists in English, I learned it in German initially. 
and this is when a party says something and you feel the anger behind it or the sadness or the deception and they don't say it but you know it's there and then you just say ah what you just said sounds like this made you really angry and usually they say yeah absolutely I was furious and all of a sudden you have the emotion at the surface and the other party hears it also for the first time then the magical change of perspective really this is the turning point of most dialogue processes when you you manage that the parties are able to put themselves in the shoes of the other because this is where the collection of options starts and they are able to offer things and lastly it's solution orientedness so it should have a package of solutions that are beneficial for both sides mutually agreeable mutually beneficial solutions so how can these mediative techniques be useful at Helvetas? I think they can be useful in two ways. Let's start with the internal side. We, Aradna said it at the beginning, resolving conflicts is difficult, conflicts are time consuming and energy draining, and they're also financially really costly. A KPMG Germany study of 2009 actually tried to calculate conflict costs for the first time, and around 20% of personnel costs are due to conflicts between team members or with one specific employee. So that's quite a lot. <coughs> so internally at Helvetas, having these mediative techniques is really important also when it comes to leadership. When you're leading a team, when you're leading an initiative, a process, holding these techniques and being aware of them can only make your initiative or your team more successful and can help a team build. And when we're looking at our project work, um, I'm still relatively new in my first year at Helvetas, but what I've learned about this organization so far is that we adopt quite a few of these attitudes, our way of communicating, how we facilitate processes, how we facilitate workshops, adopting these techniques and doing that in that specific way. And in that regard, Helvetas is quite special and that in a positive way. So um, these mediative techniques are not only useful in conflict transformation or governance related projects, even though Helvetas has recently conducted the first mediation training in Bangladesh by Regula, who's sitting there in the back. Um, but it's important for all our projects as we see ourselves as a facilitator of development processes. And ultimately, if you have this mediative attitude by the characteristics that I just explained to you, it just allows for a deeper understanding of the issues that are at hand and for a greater connection with your colleagues, the partners or the primary stakeholders we work with. Thank you very much.